you for joining us today. I'm Dr. Rachel Zabano. I'm a pediatrician here at Hogue Medical Group in Orange County. And today, we're gonna talk about uh, what we can expect in the first year of our baby's life. A lot of us, when we're going home and we have our baby in our hands, we're probably all thinking, my baby's home now, now what? So we're gonna discuss a few things that I think are important to help us enhance our experience while taking care of our beautiful new baby. I'm gonna go ahead and start the talk now. So the first thing we need to look at is what are we gonna do at the hospital? So the first thing is we're gonna be in the delivery room. The most important thing in the delivery room is the golden hour. We want mom and baby to bond in that first hour of life. That is the most important one, and it goes a long way into helping mom with her breastfeeding journey. Um, the other thing we're going to get is uh, the baby's going to get erythromycin eye ointment, the hepatitis B vaccine, and the vitamin K injections. Those are very important. They are standard of care, and um, I, I always recommend that everybody in the family get together, discuss all of the issues before, beforehand, so that when you're at the hospital, you can make informed decisions for your baby. These are, again, these are very important. I highly recommend them. The next thing is when you're at the hospital, we need to know what we're gonna, what, what's gonna happen. So the pediatrician is going to come in and examine the baby every day, every day until the day um, of discharge. And it's gonna be one of us. Um, there's also the lactation team. They are an amazing team. The, um, they are there to help you with lactation issues, with latching, with breastfeeding. You can always talk to the nursing staff as well. They are very well versed on this and also the pediatricians. We're all there to help you. Our biggest goal is to get you um, on that happy pathway of breastfeeding. The other thing is the baby's gonna have their daily weights every day and they're gonna get their vitals um, done. They are gonna go through some screening tests before they're discharged. One of them is the bilirubin where um, we check for jaundice. The other things on the discharge, they're gonna get a hearing screen, a cardiac screen, and of course the newborn metabolic screen. These all um, are very important to prevent any, um, any issues that we can pick up early on. Um, from the day that you are admitted, the, the staff will be talking to you and planning actively for your discharge so that by the end of the day, when you're ready for discharge, nothing is, um, um, that you are comfortable and everything is set. After the baby's home, now we need to take care of the baby. One of the ways is, of course, they have to come in for their well, by, well baby checks. Um, and I've put, I placed a list of um, the appointments the baby's gonna have for the well baby checks. Um, they do look like the first few months. We do see them more often than, than the rest of the year. And that's important because these are, we're trying to watch the baby for um, main important milestones. We also check for, um, um, the bonding and how the parents are doing if, if there's a support system. So for every well check, the doctor is going to go through all of these. We're gonna do a physical exam we're, and on time. We're gonna talk about the growth and the nutrition. We're gonna go through some safety um, uh, issues that we need to uh, prepare for in the house for every, uh, for every step of the way. And of course, general health, and we're gonna talk about uh, vaccinations. So in terms of growth, the babies for the first two years of life, uh, um, they are gonna get their head circumference, weight, and um, length at every well check. So in terms of length, the babies do go through a great, uh, a big period of growth in the first six months of life. So in terms of length, the first six months of life, the baby will grow at about a rate of a half an inch to an inch per month. Um, I don't recommend measuring the baby every day, but this is the reason for the well checks. We plot them and you get to see a wonderful progression of how the baby's doing in terms of growth parameters. By the first year of birth, they're gonna be one and a half times their birth length. And, and weight, they, they gain about a pound and a half to two pounds per month. That actually comes out to be about a one to two ounces per day. But again, please don't weigh the baby every day. You don't need to. Um, you can. You can overall tell that the baby's growing well just from every day, from watching him every day. By the first birthday, the baby's gonna triple their birth weight. So in terms of nutrition, we want to ensure that the baby's exclusively breastfed for at least the first six months of life. We, we do recommend up to two years, 
but at least exclusively the first six months of life. Newborns will feed many times throughout the day. Some babies will graze throughout the day. Some babies will, uh, will have a set time. But on average, babies will eat about eight to 12 times a day, which comes out to be every two to three hours. At this time in their lives, do not worry too much about the schedule. The main important thing is that if the baby does not ask for food in the first couple of months, within three hours, then you do want to intervene and feed the baby. Other than that, baby can feed any time and as many times as you want. Uh, breastfed, baby tends, breastfed babies tend to um, uh, uh, set their own schedule. And of course, breast is best. And the reason we want the breastfeeding is we want the benefits from that breast milk. So breastfed babies tend to have a decreased risk for SIDS. They also are at a decreased risk for certain infections, including um, lower respiratory tract infections, ear infections, uh, meningitis, UTIs, and some kids with diarrhea, they actually improve when they're on um, breast milk. Breast milk does optimize development and improve cognition in the baby. And of course, the bonding that comes along with breastfeeding is very important for both baby and mom. Moms do get a lot of benefit from breastfeeding, not just emotionally, but also physically. They are more likely to get to their pre-pregnancy uh, weight when they're breastfeeding. They're more likely to have decreased postpartum bleeding, and they have a decreased chance, uh, risk of ovarian cancer. Um, the other thing about breast milk is it's economical and it's ready, readily available, and you don't have to do any dishes. So for breastfeeding, it is natural, but it is not easy. It does take time to establish good breastfeeding. Don't give up. Use us, call us, talk to the lactation consultants. Um, you can always try your best, and we'll go from there. Um, I actually included the Hogue Baby Line number for you, uh, for your information. Please do not hesitate to contact us at any time. So a lot of times I get a uh, a lot of calls from parents asking if they're making enough milk for the baby. Um, the answer is always yes. It has to do with supply and demand. If the baby wants it, they, they, will, they, um, they will trigger mom's body to supply it. So the more you put the baby on the breast from the beginning, the better. Um, and the other thing about breast milk is the first few days, you're going to get the colostrum, which is the yellow colored, very small amount of milk that comes out. It is actually sufficient for the baby at that time. It does provide all the nutrients and the fluids that the baby needs. It's high in protein. It's high in vitamins and minerals. It is high in immunologic components, which help fight infections. Um, and it's, it is lower in carbohydrates and fats. The, the, after the colostrum, at about three to five days of life, that's usually when the moms feel um, that, the, that the milk is coming in, the mature milk is coming in. Their breasts would feel full. The milk color will change. It'll be more of the creamy white color. That milk is higher in fat and carbohydrates. It is a little lower in protein, antibodies, and other nutrients, but it is still sufficient to take care of the baby and to protect the baby. Um, one thing that will help with with trying to figure out if you're making enough milk for the baby, I like to use this photo. It kind of gives you an idea of how big the baby's stomach is. And as you can see, the milk that you're making matches the size of the stomach at that time. The colostrum on the first day, it does look like a little bit, but the size of the baby's tummy is almost the size of a cherry. And as they get older and the stomach expands, the baby's going to demand more milk and the body, your body will respond and you'll make more milk. So never, you, all you can do is just keep putting them on the breast. You can always tell that the babies are getting enough because they will be um, stooling, urinating, and they'll gain weight. So that's one reassuring thing. Um, and the other thing you can, t you can kind of get an idea of what's happening inside the baby's uh, body is the size of baby's hand, a fist, is the size of his stomach. So that actually helps also to imagine where we're at in terms of how much food the baby's needing. So let's go on to other normal things that babies will do in the first few months of life. So babies will burp, they will hiccup, and they will spit up. Spitting up is very normal. Most babies will spit up almost after every feed, and that is still normal. 
spit ups are not painful. They are not, they do not, um, they're not a, a risk for choking. They are not, uh, 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 they do not cause pain for the baby. They're not, uh, uh, they do not cause all these things. Um, babies do vomit though, and they do vomit once a day, and that's still normal. As long as the baby, again, of the big picture, the baby's doing well. If the baby's arching back when they're vomiting or when they're feeding, and they look very uncomfortable while they're spitting up, and the, the spit-ups are large and continuous, we definitely need to know, because that is something we need to look at. It could be reflux, it could be anything else. So it's always a good idea to contact your pediatrician if you have any concerns. Burping is another thing that babies will do. Um, burping is actually one of the ways to help minimize spitting. For those babies who spit up a lot, there are a few things to do and one of them is burping. The best time to do the burping is when you're switching from breast to breast during the feed. Um, if you are doing formula feeding, usually we say wait, about, do that every two to three ounces while the baby's feeding. And we want to do the burping for the first six months of life. The other thing the babies do um, is hiccuping. It can occur multiple times a day, and it is still normal. <clears throat> Frequent burping of the baby can actually minimize your hiccups. There are other things we can do to minimize spit-ups, um, and I wanted to mention those before we, we move on, is um, the ba when you're breastfeeding, the best thing is avoid interruptions during that breastfeeding moment. This is supposed to be the time for bonding. Um, sudden noises, bright lights while feeding really um, uh, interrupts the baby and it actually increases the chance of them uh, spitting up. The best, you want to be in a, in, a, uh, in a nicely lit, warm, comfortable place with your baby in a quiet place. The other thing is doing smaller, more frequent feeds, you're less likely to have a spitting up baby. Um, if you feed too much at one time, sometimes you can run into the, um, the problem of overfeeding. But again, we want to look at the big picture. Um, let's move on to the next slide. So part of optimizing the nutrition of the baby is vitamin D supplementation, especially when you're exclusively breastfeeding in the first 12 months of life. You do want to give it, uh, the recommended dose is 400 international units per day. The reason we want to do that is mom's breast milk does have uh, vitamin D in it. It is sufficient, but we are meant to get uh, more, more of that, the rest of that from sunlight. Um, and these days, most of us are indoors. We want to make sure that the baby's getting um, the optimal amount. Uh, formula fed babies should actually get vitamin D supplementation as well until they are able to take in about 33 ounces a day, which is about a liter. Usually they get to that point when they're about nine to 12 months of life. So, um, however, formula does include the 400 international units of, of uh, vitamin D in it uh, already. So again, talk to your pediatrician about um, the supplementation for the vitamin D. I placed a few different items out there. They're all, they are all effective. It is a matter of preference. Some are one drop a day, some are five drops a day, some are one milliliter a day. It is up to you, whichever one you like. Some of them also include probiotics. I'm a big probiotics person, so it's fine with me. Um, but the main thing is we want that vitamin D in there. It is very important for the uh, teeth and bone formation. It regulates the calcium absorption in the body. Um, so, and for all of us, and for mom especially, we want to make sure that she's actually getting the proper nutrition as well. So um, some of the foods that are high in vitamin D are fortified dairy products, fish oils, egg yolks, and of course we want to get some sunlight to get that vitamin D. So. Let's move on to introducing solids. I get a lot of calls of when do I start? Some people say six months, some people say four months. Um, the answer is when the baby's developmentally ready. When that baby's ready, then you're ready. Usually that happens between the four, and, uh, four months and six months of life. And generally you'll notice that the baby is trying to reach out for your food and trying to, staring at you while you're eating that, that hamburger. So that, that's a signal that the baby's ready. So you can initiate. Generally, some babies you will start, but they will refuse the food. If that happens, don't force it. Try again in a week. 
Once they start taking in the food, don't, feel, don't be surprised if they start spitting out any new food um, uh, in the beginning. They will do that for, for at least 10 to 15 times when they, uh, when they taste something new in the beginning. It's not because they don't like it. It's they're trying to work out these new textures and these new t flavors, and they're trying to figure out what to do with that. So enjoy it. Um, food in the first year of life is more, I look at it as more of an appetizer than a meal. So the main source of calories are still breast milk and formula. So, and when you're introducing food, always start with one thing, introduce it for two, three days, and then add a, n a new thing every two to three days. This will help us kind of um, um, break down um, any, uh, any, um, reactions that the baby might have, it kind of narrows down the, the list of offending um, uh, allergens. And yes, you can start um, um, peanut butter at around four months of age. Um, the other thing we want to look at is diapers and wet, wet diapers. How many type diapers is the baby supposed to have? So the, the easy answer is one, two, three, four, five. Day one, you want one diaper minimum. Day two, two. Day three, three diapers. Day four, wet, four wet diapers, and so on. Um, once you pass the first week of life, most babies will get about five to eight uh, wet diapers a day. In terms of stool, um, they will stool more frequently in the beginning. They're going to have that thick meconium, sticky, tarry um, uh, stool, and that will slowly transition to the brown, yellow, looser stools. Breastfed babies in the first couple of months, this, they will stool almost every feed. So be ready for that. It is loose, it is yellow, it is seedy. Sometimes it looks like diarrhea, especially when the first milk comes in around day five to seven. I get a lot of calls about that. That is normal. Beyond two months of life, it starts decreasing in frequency. Formula fed babies, their stools are darker, they're thicker in consistency, but they will still stool. So, uh, sorry, excuse me. Um, one last thing, the, uh, the stool colors that we need to know about right away is if the stool is black, if it's white or clay colored, or if there's blood in there. Any other color is fine. Green, yellow, brown, all of those are good. So in diapers, <clears throat> the main thing about diapers is you want to keep the skin dry. You want to change the diapers frequently. It does not matter if you're using cloth or disposable diapers. That is uh, your own preference. Um, as whichever one works for you, whichever one you're happy with, go with that. Uh, the main thing is to find the one that works for you. Um, applying diaper rash cream really helps. You don't have to wait until the baby has a diaper rash. You can actually use it all the time. I always say lather it everywhere. It, it acts as a protector, as a barrier cream, because when you're sitting um, in a diaper all day with some urine, some stool, heat, humidity, this, this um, sets you up for some um, skin irritations. So it not, never hurts to do that. In the first month or so, I usually, uh, um, I usually have people do vi um, Vaseline, but uh, you can do any of those diaper creams. Next, for diaper rashes, most babies will get a diaper rash here and there. It is not a problem, but we need to know how to manage it. The, the, the time you want to call your pediatrician is when it, at least when it gets to the moderate to severe stage. If there are bris blisters, pus-filled sores, open sores, weeping lesions, uh, or a worsening rash that does not, keep, does not go away regardless of what you try, we need to know about that. We need to step in. It could be a fungal infection. It might need um, some creams, medicated creams. But in general, if it's mild or slight uh, skin irritation, lather on that, that diaper cream. Sleep. Babies are going to sleep a lot, and lucky them. <laughs> in the first few months, they are going to sleep about 15 to 17 hours a day with, with, uh, with um, uh, waking up uh, in between for feedings. In the first two months of life, they will wake up about every two to three hours throughout the day and throughout the night. And that's when we say um, that's when they're going to wake up for feeding. They're going to give you those hunger cues where they're alert and active and start crying. Um, so you want to make sure you're feeding at those times. And I always say sleep when the baby sleeps, at least in the beginning. Um, as they get older, they're going to uh, sleep, uh, sleep throughout, through the night, and they're going to have naps during the day. And the naps will shorten in number and, and uh, length as they get older. Uh, I do get a lot of calls about sleep training. We do not recommend sleep training or crying it out, uh, as they say, until at least four months of, 
uh, of, uh, of life. So the other thing that we uh, always look for in terms of development um, for the baby is motor development. How are they progressing? Are they meeting all the milestones? Are they rolling over at the correct age? Are they reaching uh, and using that grasp, um, that grasp uh, uh, action or the pincer grasp? Um, so I, this graph, um, this picture is actually a really nice way of showing the gradual way that the, that the baby um, acquires their uh, developmental milestones. There are certain things that we look for at certain well baby checks um, and if the baby does not meet that it gives us a red flag for further evaluation but the main thing is um, babies around around the age of two months they will start looking around around four months is when they want the, when they start trying to flip from tummy to back around six months back to front and they start sitting up around um, eight months. They'll do the tripod, as you can see here, where they're touching the floor while they're sitting, um, and so on. So our biggest concern is if they're not turning over from uh, tummy to back or back to tummy, by the time they're four to six months, we need, uh, we need to make sure they're doing that. And one way to get them to these milestones is to actively get involved with the baby and allow them the freedom to actually move around and do these, um, these, uh, um, these actions or activities. Language development, they start cooing and making, uh, making uh, verbal sounds and gurgles at two months of age. They do social smiling at two months of age. So the more you look at them and the more you talk to them, um, the, the better. You want, they want to see your mouth. Uh, four to six months, they start babbling. At four months, they actually do the um, blow raspberries. Um, things to look for uh, that are uh, red flag signs are if the baby is not speaking or making any sort of sound at all by the time they're nine months, hopefully we catch it before that, that baby needs an evaluation for hearing immediately because baby should be saying something by nine months of age. The first spoken word other than mama, dada is usually around the 12 months. This is just a guideline. Some babies will talk earlier, some babies will talk later, but the main thing is the more interactions you have with the baby in terms of reading and talking to them and showing them pictures, the better. So moving on to safety. Um, there are a lot of things you have to do around the house and for the baby to keep them safe. Um, one of them is sleep. A lot of us love to co-sleep. It's such a beautiful thing to hold that baby and hug them and fall asleep with them in your arms, but we want to make sure that the baby's safe. So um, room sharing instead of co-sleeping or bed sharing is a lot safer, and you still get all the benefits of, um, of having the baby around you, of being able to breastfeed quickly, uh, and also to get some sleep for you and um, the um, and the rest of the family or the parent. The other thing is when you're co-sleeping, it actually kind of interferes with the intimacy between mom and dad. So it is better to put them in their own crib in the same room, but a little bit far. Um, the, the other thing is, of course, back to sleep. They sleep alone in their crib. That is a firm mattress, nothing else in the bed to interfere and to, uh, for them to get caught in and room should be cool. 69 to 72 degrees uh, uh, temperature is ideal for that, and dark, quiet rooms. You can use the sleep sacks. I put a picture of that. When they're a bit older, they really help, and you don't have to worry about the baby getting tangled with their, uh, in their covers. Car safety, of course, is very important. Choosing the right car seat is very important. The nice thing these days is they have the convertible one, so you don't have to always go out and buy a new one as the baby gets older. They do convert. Um, the main thing is baby has to be rear facing in that car seat until two years of age. There are babies who are very tall and they run into that problem where they're uncomfortable and they can't sit in that position, but they still have to. It is dangerous for them to be sitting in a squished place with their knees up in their face when they're, when they're facing, uh, rear facing, but, uh, so, uh, but, but they still have to by law and for their safety. So uh, a lot of the rear facing uh, chairs, you can actually expand them so it can accommodate for that tall child. And the reason we want that is because of their neck and brain, we want to protect them from accidents. After that, they can do the forward facing and then move on to boosters and seat belts. 
uh, look at your baby's age and weight when you're buying those car seats. And the other thing is expiration date is very important. Do not take, uh, do not use an, uh, a car seat that has been, that has expired. Uh, you run into a problem with the plastic being warped or old or broken, cracked, it's not safe. The other thing is always ask if you're buying a, a used one or a secondhand one, make sure it's never been in a car accident. Doesn't matter if it's a fender bender, that uh, car seat is no longer safe, kind of like the helmet. Um, there are other safety measures um, that you want to do um, at home, and it has to do with childproofing the house, you know, and make sure the water is turned uh, to 120 degrees at, their, um, um, at the, the uh, hot water, um, the heater, I'm sorry. Um, and, you know, putting up the gates as they're getting older. Uh, you want to stay away from things that can cause choking hazards and, of course, put away anything that is uh, caustic, uh, either lock it up or somewhere high where the baby doesn't get it. Babies do get fevers, and we do get a lot of calls uh, about warm versus fever. What is warm, and when do we know the baby's hot, and when do we know the baby's cold? How much clothes do I put on my baby? Um, so fever is 100.4 or higher for, uh, for the first two months of life. Um, I know with COVID, it's a little bit different, but for this, in this case, um, you can always use the thermometer, always call us. Um, dressing the baby makes a big difference. The baby can look warm and can look like they have a fever if they're overwrapped. So the general rule is judge how you feel. If you're cold, the baby's cold. If you're warm, the baby's warm. So dress the same layers for the baby as you would with yourself. With the exception is cold weather, add one more on the baby. So another way to protect the baby is cocooning. Infants are very susceptible, of course, to uh, infectious diseases. Um, so getting everybody around the baby to protect the baby by vaccinating, by keeping their hands clean, by using hand sanitizers, um, and of course these days wearing the mask everywhere, social distancing, and wiping down all of the um, um, high traffic areas in the house so that everything stays clean really helps. Vaccinations for adults is extremely important. You want to do that herd immunity for that child until they are ready to get their vaccines. So a few of them that really need to be looked at for anyone who's caring, caring for your child is the Tdap, the flu for the flu uh, during the flu season, which is coming up, the Prevnar. For the elderly at a certain age, they need to get that every five years to protect themselves from pneumococcal pneumonias, not just for the baby, but definitely you need to protect grandma and grandpa. And they can talk about the shingles vaccine with their, uh, with their physician. So, of course, immunizations for babies are extremely important. They are safe. They are very effective. Um, they are especially effective if they are given the way, um, uh, the way that is um, recommended by the CDC and the AAP. Please talk to us about them. Let's make a plan. I do not recommend sp spreading them out or spacing them out or waiting. That is, most pediatricians will tell you the same. There is a reason they are given that way. So please talk to us. Let's discuss and we can make a plan that everybody's comfortable with. This is an example um, uh, of which vaccines are going to be given and the distribution in the first month of life. Some of these, uh, thankfully, are combined. So you have less shots uh, for the baby which is kind of nice. Combo vaccines are just as effective with the benefit of less pokes. Um, and we're coming up to the end of it. These are our different offices. We are everywhere, so please find us, ask for us, anything you need, let us know. And we're done. Any questions? Thank you for listening. Um, doesn't look like we have any questions. I couldn't have done it all in one sitting, did I? No questions? Okay. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we look forward to seeing you in our office. Call us anytime and have a wonderful time. Stay safe.